good afternoon. Good afternoon. San Wanan. Huyenach. Huyenant. I wanted to find out how you say good evening in Yoruba. Ekurole. 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 Please uh, be seated. Uh, Professor Salki Gravit, Huyenach means good evening. <laughs> you see, in, uh, 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 in, in African languages, certainly South African languages, good evening and good night the is the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Professor Charles Mboa, uh, Acting Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, Professor Esther Akinlabi, uh, the professor that we are going to be inducting tonight. Professor Joitsna uh, Duta Majumda from the Indian Institute uh, of Technology in Kalakpur. Uh, for those of you who do not know what uh, the Indian Institute of Technology uh, is this a uh, group of uh, prestigious technological uh, universities in, in India. Senior leaders of the university, I see Professor Gravett, I see Professor um, Sina, I saw someone who looked like uh, Professor Shirin Mutala. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, hidden and, and all other people that I have not been able to see. Members of Senate and other academics, uh, distinguished guests who have taken time to come and, uh, and uh, witness this ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, Saniwanaan, Huyanand, good evening, Tawela. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Esther Akinlabi. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to her beloved ones, uh, her husband, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, if you could just stand so that you could be acknowledged. <laughs> Coincidentally, Stephen was my PhD student many years ago. <laughs> Special guests and her, and her colleagues. I have not seen your children. If you could be acknowledged also, if you could just stand up. You have to do an inaugural lecture uh, sometimes. <laughs> <in your day. laughs> but tonight is not your night, it's your mother's night. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people from the faculty of uh, engineering. It almost feels like home. Uh, I used to be the dean of the faculty of engineering. The faculty has changed. Uh, see people from the College of Business and Economics, uh, Professor uh, Daniel uh, is also here. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you. For Professor Akinlabi, and of course for us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into the office by the vice chancellor and deliver their inaugural addresses so that uh, the public can be able to know what they are doing. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. In Isi Tosa, 
we say, Ugu tweswa, izi danga kwisi gawa, so ujinga lwazi. Uh, Professor Pichana, have I done it correctly? <laughs> have I done it correctly? Yes. No, thank you. Very, we are very kind. <laughs> you see, uh, Kosa is only my 11th language. No? This loosely translated refers to assuming the role of the professor. Of course, in colonial traditions, subscribed by, to by universities, this refers to the gown and the cap. And the gown and the cap was actually inherited from the Catholic Church. The concept of a modern university actually originated in the Catholic Church. In fact, some of the first universities in the world, uh, the University of Paris, uh, the University of Bologna, the University of Oxford, and the University of Cambridge were actually Catholic institutions. Traditionally, in an African uh, uh, settings, the wise people normally received a blanket. Ingubo. Once we have listened to the inaugural address, the gown or ingubo, denoting the professorship, will be formally uh, assumed by Professor Akin Labi. Today, we gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Akin Labi to the illustrious community of scholars at the University of Johannesburg. Last week, we were giving an honorary doctorate to Professor Engela, who won a Nobel Prize in 2003 for his work on co-integration. That is a concept in mathematics and economics. And today, we are going to be inaugurating Professor Akin Labi. I think let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> it is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. One wise woman once said, knowledge only becomes education when it finds a purpose in society and fulfills it, close quote. Professors provide a university with its identity, character, and academic legitimacy and integrity. Therefore, professors are supposed to profess to their students and to the wider community. The inaugural lecture in which they profess is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening, we will listen to Professor Agin Labi as the gown goes to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates in society and through to eternity. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat, Humboldt, a university referred to the whole community of scholars and students engaged in a common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities have been viewed as instruments serving the purpose of the economy, of society, and of the politics. I would hope that we can break out this narrow conceptualization and reflect on the university as contributing ultimately to public good. Edward Said, in an article on defiance and taking positions, offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual as one who commands a vast knowledge of his or her discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation. 
the intellectual who considered, considers it necessary to step into the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority than consolidating it. To step out of the boundaries of the academy, to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of proving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden, and to provide alternatives to mistaken policies. In short, the aim of an intellectual is to ask questions. As Albert Einstein puts it, the measure, I quote, the measure of how wise or clever you are is not by how many questions you can answer, but by how many questions you can pose. Close quote. <coughs> it remains then for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors from society. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor of ideas while continuing to be flagship carriers of our disciplines, all in service of society? This evening we will listen to Professor Akin Labi as one further step in, in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. In summary, as professors, we should criticize, self-criticize, and question ourselves and our ideas time and time again. Let me now invite the Executive Dean Professor Charles Mboa to introduce Professor Esther Akinlabi. I thank you, Kialibua, Siabonga Bayadanki, and goes. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Vice Chancellor, um, it is my honor to introduce um, um, Esther Akinlabi. Um, Esther Titilayo Akinlabi, Ni Orunifemi, was born in Kaba, Kog State in Nigeria. Her first degree in agricultural engineering and a master's uh, in mechanical engineering were from the Federal Institute of Technology, Akure, as well as the master's from um, Port Harcourt in Nigeria. She did her doctoral studies um, at Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, now called Nelson Mandela University. Um, after the award of the first degree, she had a chance to work in industry um, where she did quite well and in that time was also a, a temporary academic uh, at, at um, universities in Nigeria. Um, <coughs> Professor Akinlabi currently serves our, as our Vice Dean Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, um, where she uh, serves with uh, distinction. Um, she was our 
first female head of department for the Department of Mechanical Engineering um, at the University of um, Johannesburg from January 2015 to April 2017. Just a bit about her research. Um, her PhD uh, was on friction stair welding, uh, which was looking at um, processing of dissimilar materials, especially aluminum and copper. Um, and from that work, she has uh, built a lot of um, profile. Um, she started at the University of uh, Johannesburg as a lecturer in November 2010 and grew through the ranks uh, to associate professor um, and later on as a full professor. Um, my major interaction with her was from the time when she was associate professor, <coughs> when she walked into my office and said um, she wanted to, me to mentor her, um, but over time, um, in some cases, the mentee became the mentor. <coughs> um, <coughs> in the past seven years, she has done a, an excellent board of work in terms of her research, mainly focusing on advanced modern manufacturing uh, technology and systems, uh, working furthermore in additive manufacturing uh, in collaboration with the scientific uh, Center for Scientific and Industrial Research uh, in Pretoria. Um, she has done quite a lot in terms of laser metal deposition um, and working on um, functionally graded uh, material. Um, some of the work has looked at um, cladding uh, titanium with, with titanium carbide. Um, and this work has also extended to bio applications um, where you look at you know, uh, compost material uh, applications. More recently, she has been doing some work also in renewable energy. Um, I know I've worked with her uh, on the biogas project with the city of Johannesburg, working also on wind and solar uh, technology. Um, she has also been a mentor, and I think from um, the summary you see that she has done a lot of work with students, uh, with over 20 uh, PhD students currently and, and, and 12 master's students. But also what's not indicated is that um, she had mentored uh, female heads of departments, which now constitutes um, you know, more than 30% or close to 40% of the the administrative staff uh, in the Faculty of Engineering in the built environment. She has graduated seven PhDs and several masters, um, and has also published two books, uh, edited uh, one uh, book series. She has authored more than 200 peer-reviewed articles um, that have um, brought in quite a lot of um, also income to the university, and has um, filed two patents. Uh, she has reviewed for many international journals. She has been a guest speaker um, and a keynote speaker at different international fora. Um, she is Y2 a National Research Foundation rated researcher. Um, and, and I think from what I, I'm saying, you can tell that um, re-rating maybe is overdue, but that's coming soon in terms of her profile. Um, she has also had a lot of uh, funding um, no subsidy for working with um, CSIR, and, and in terms of um, funding from ESCOM, uh, United Kingdom, and, and from many sources of uh, donors and funding agencies. Um, she has collaborated with many expert researchers, um, and today I think um, the response uh, from the keynote will be from one of her collaborators, a distinguished professor from India. Um, and, you know, she's a woman, I think, <coughs> who has distinguished herself in terms of the work that she's doing um, and exercises excellence and passion in whatever she does. Um, just to summarize in terms of recognition uh, that has uh, come her way, 
In 2017, uh, she was a recipient of the top 20, the sorry, top 50 inspiring women in South Africa, um, an initiative which is um, you know, coordinated by the Kingdom of Netherlands. She was also awarded in 2017 the uh, Overall Academic Excellence Award uh, from the Old Mutual uh, in South Africa. In 2016, she was a winner of the Distinguished Young Women Researcher Award uh, in the category Physical and Engineering Sciences, um, offered by the Women in Science. She also got the, the Women in Science uh, Award. In 2015, she was recognized for excellence in teaching um, by the Congress of Nigerian Students of the University of Johannesburg. She was also a finalist of the TW Kambule NSTF Award, uh, recognizing her outstanding contribution to science, engineering, and innovation. In 2014, uh, she was a recipient of the UJ Vice Chancellor um, Distinguished Award uh, for Innovator of the Year, um, and I think you have seen that she has a, a, a number of patents. Um, she was also awarded um, Excellence in Engineering and Technology uh, in Academic Research Award from Women in Engineering and the Built Environment. She's a member of um, um, South African Young Academy of Sciences and is a registered um, professional with the Engineering Council of South Africa. So I think uh, that introduction sets the scene for her. Uh, and I'm sure now you, you are eager to go and, and to listen to her. Thank you, Professor Agenda. Thank you, Prof. Mbawa. Good evening, our esteemed Vice Chancellor of Chilizi Marwala. Good evening to Prof. Solop Sina, representing the MEC this evening, and to the members of the Executive Leadership Group, Prof. Sarah Gravit and uh, Prof. Daniel, to the members of the Senior Leadership Group of the University, to colleagues, colleagues from other universities present here this evening, to many of my friends, my students, and to my families. You are welcome to my inaugural address, which I have titled, Joining All About Life. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction, give some fundamentals in the field of welding. I will go ahead and highlight some of my personal contributions to the field of friction steel welding in particular, and in the field of laser-based additive manufacturing. <coughs> I was just wondering behind my computer when I was trying to put the slides together, when you received your invite and you saw the title, Joining All About Life, I was wondering what was going through your mind at that particular point in time. Did you actually agree with me? Did you or you did not? So I was just wondering, perhaps you strongly agree or you said, no, joining cannot be all about life. Or you were just neutral and said, well, let me get there and go hear what <laughs> Esther is got to say about this particular topic that she's put together for her inaugural address. I'm hoping that after this address this evening, I'm hoping that I will be able to convince you that indeed joining is all about, is all about life. You will agree with me that scientifically, human life started with the fact that there was a joining. <coughs> the sperm cell, and the egg cell had to fuse together in a natural way. There was a journey that happened. And in that, I'm standing before you today because a journey took place some years ago. <laughs> and I believe you agree with me. Despite the advent of the 3D technology, where we build component parts at one go, I still believe strongly that many of the components we use in our homes, even in this or the auditorium where we are today, the chair, the table, they are all pieces of various components that were put together. And you will agree with me that the majority of what we use on a daily basis has one element of joining or the other. 
I hope you, you all follow me on this journey. And I, I hope I'm already beginning to convince you that indeed joining is all about life. The first metal recorded in the literature to ever be joined in history happened to be copper. And since then, it's still uh, being used, it finds its application today. And copper has been used ever since in history and still continues to be joined today because it is a material that is very, very malleable, easily hammered and can be easily bent. And it finds its applications in juries, in coins, and many other applications. The history of joining dates back to 5000 BC, and it was first recorded in the literature in Greece. The Greek researchers at that particular point at that time used copper to produce the coins that they spent in, in, in Greece, and they were the first to produce coins from copper. From there, the use of copper as uh, to produce coins then expanded across the world, up until uh, even in here in South Africa as well. For us in Africa, welding was believed to start about 4,000 BC, also with copper as well, and that was recorded in Egypt. Not until 1330 BC, when the Golden Death uh, Mask was produced by joining copper materials together as a funeral mask for the King Pharaoh at that particular year. And in general, with civilization over time, the joining of materials then extended from only copper to several other materials. And even today, we also join plastics, not only metals now. Welding can be categorized into two major, major groups. One is the fusion welding, wherein the materials has to be melted before they can be joined, and usually with the use of an electrode. And that is the welding technology that is very, very popular that we all know about. The roadside uh, welders, that is what you see them having, using their, their welding machines to do. Further to that, some, uh, so, some decades ago, we then have the solid state welding technology wherein the materials does not have to be melted. Technology, technology then improved with the solid state welding because it has uh, better properties compared to the fusion welding uh, technologies. And of, uh, among the six solid state welding technology, the latest of that technology happens to be fusion steel welding. And that is my own passion. That then happens to be the field that I have worked on in the past 10 years of my career. Fusion steel welding technology was invented in 1991 by Dr. Wayne Thomas, who was a welding engineer at the Welding Institute in the UK. The process is a continuous process wherein we plunge the welding tool through the machine and we plunge into the abutting surfaces, we steer, and then we join two materials together, leaving behind a solid phase joint. The process is very suitable for all kinds of joints and for all kinds of materials. And the welding temperature happens to be between 60 and 80% of the melting temperature of the base material. The picture you have here, this is Dr. Wayne Thomas here, who is the inventor of refrigeration steel welding technology. And this is Prof. Santos in Germany, and here is Esther. <laughs> <laughs> this picture was taken in 2010 in Hamburg, Germany, when I went for a conference, only on friction steel welding. Uh, it was a privilege and a honor for me to meet Dr. Wayne Thomas. And since then, we have maintained a very good relationship. And I'm very happy that I have such a father figure in the field that I am working on. I will now show you a very brief video of the pieces to be joined are aligned in a friction stir welding machine, then clamped into a stationary position. When the rotating pin tool reaches a predetermined speed, it is axially plunged into the work pieces, creating frictional heat at the interface. As the material softens, the pin tool continues to axially move into the pieces, expelling flash material from the interface. 
Once the pin tool reaches the proper depth, the pin tool's shoulder contacts the material surfaces, generating frictional heat under the tool's shoulder. While maintaining part contact, the pin tool moves through the work pieces, softening the material along its path. The material is swept from the leading edge of the pin tool to the trailing portion where it is reconsolidated into the weld trough. After the program weld path is complete, the pin tool is moved to a non-critical area of the workpiece where it is then extracted from the part. Thank you. The technology comes with a lot of benefits compared to the fusion welding technology. It comes up with excellent joint properties. It's a green technology. And compared to fusion welding technology, there's no film, no smoke that is produced, as you can see from the video just now. It's <coughs> an environmentally friendly and energy efficient process. The first friction steel welding application on a, on a commercial basis was in 2004, wherein the US government gave a funding award of about $300 million to TWI to conduct research. The scope of what they had to do was to produce this Eclipse 500 business jet. And airplanes generally has a lot of riveted joints on the panels. So the assignment of these researchers was to remove riveted joints in panels of this plane and replace with friction steel welding. Because the researchers at that time told the government that they can reduce the weight of aircraft, thereby saving energy. So they were given this assignment, and this project was concluded in 2006. And indeed, they had 60% savings on the weight and great improvement in the fuel efficiency of the, of the 500 business jet. And that was the first successful commercialization of the process. In August 2017, under the Royal Academy uh, of Engineering of, of, of UK funding, three uh, researchers, myself from UJ, I have uh, Dr. Shongwe from TUT, and Dr. Suni of Waters Institute University. We came up with, we had a joint proposal wherein we were on board and off to TWI. And we had some, some of our students with us. And these are photos that we took at the Welding Institute in Cambridge, uh, UK, in August 2017. The technology has then since grown over time and has been greatly commercialized. One commercial application I'm going to leave with you this evening is the use of the, of the process in the underground tubes in London. When next you visit London, and you're stepping into the, 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 the underground uh, tube, and you hear, please mind the gap between the train and the platform. Remember, you're jumping into a train that has friction steel wells on its uh, panels. I hope you will do me that favor. You will not forget that particular point for, for this underground address. Other applications are found in shipbuilding, petrochemical industry, and many other applications. Now coming to Africa. Friction steel welding technology in Africa. The friction steel welding platform at the Nelson Mandela University happens to be the first friction steel welding platform on African soil. And I was privileged to be the first PhD candidate that worked on this platform. So I can say that Esther is the first PhD in the field of friction steel welding in Africa. <laughs> thank, thank you. Since uh, graduation in 2011, I have then since continued to collaborate with my alma mater. At the, at the Nelson Mandela University with Prof. Hattin. And from time to time, we visit the university with quite a number of my students. And this was one of the photos on one of our trips. I have Patrick here, who is now a postdoctoral fellow with me. This is the operator of the machine. Here you see Esther. And this man is my co-researcher in the field. <laughs> 
My personal contribution in the field of friction steel welding is in joining of aluminum to copper. Up to date, there is no electrode that can join aluminum to copper. Reason because of the huge difference in the melting temperature of aluminum and copper. Copper will melt, melt at 1085, while aluminum will melt at 560 degrees centigrade. So there's still ongoing research, perhaps tomorrow, I'm not sure. But as tonight, there is no electrode that can join aluminum to copper, not on fusion welding. So this is my personal contribution, wherein I was able to successfully join aluminum to copper using a friction steel welding process. And this particular work has been supported and sponsored by ESCOM. The process is a very complex process, not, a, not as simple as going to the lab and you do one, one, one or two words and you are good to go. It's not as simple as that. There's a lot of processing parameters, quite, quite substantial number of processing parameters that has to be optimized. The tool, welding tool has to be optimized. The, weld, the tool material also has to be optimized. And this I was able to achieve by using design of experiment. To, to come up with, uh, to be able to achieve welds with, with good integrity. And when we conduct welds, we always want to ascertain the joint integrity. And in so doing, we then have to characterize the welds, either through materials characterization, mechanical property, me mechanical testing, corrosion test, s diffraction, electrical resistivity, residual stresses, uh, characterizations, depending on the typical application that the weld is intended for. And these are some of the results for, for joining aluminum and copper. Starting at UG, we do not have a friction steel weld welding machine at UG. And I, and I needed to continue my research work. So what I did was to get some students together in 2011. We designed the fixtures the, uh, the backing plates, the clamping fixtures, and the tools, and all of that. And off we go. We reconfigured a milling machine at the Mechanical Engineering Science here at UJ, and successful welds were conducted. And we, uh, quite a number of students conducted, uh, had their uh, BS, uh, 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 the final year projects, and also some master students uh, used the, the reconfigured milling machine for, for about two to three years. I then went further to Toolquip and Allied, a company here in Johannesburg that are into sales and maintenance of milling machines. They also opened their doors to us, and we did have some time to play on, on, their, on their shop floor. They opened their, their, their showroom, and we were able to, we, we successfully reconfigured quite a number of their milling machines to produce welds in that particular year. And here in the photo, I, I have Maleka here. This is my humble self. And this is uh, Willem and uh, Clark. Clark. And uh, we're able to, to have uh, quite a, a number of welds produced at that particular year. Further to friction steel welding, I then moved ahead and conducted some work in surface engineering. That is improving surface properties of, uh, of, of materials. In particular, I was looking at aluminum on how to improve the properties of aluminum. And in this, I conducted some, wor some work on friction steel processing of aluminum by incorporating titanium carbide particles to improve the wear properties, and this was highly successful. And applications of these are found in aerospace and the automotive industry. With this particular slide, this is the last slide of, that is reporting, highlighting my work in the field of fission steel welding. The next couple of field slides will highlight the work that I've been able to do in the field of laser-based additive manufacturing. And in the field of friction steel welding and processing, to date, I have success successfully published over 80 papers in this particular field. Thank you. Thank you.
Now for on, on laser-based additive manufacturing. In response to the Department of Science and Technology and the National Research Foundation some years ago, there were calls for proposers, for researchers, who would like to work in the field of titanium and its alloys. And I'm happy that I have Prof. Sisa in the, in the room today and uh, Prof. Claudia Polisi as well. They have been my collaborators over a number of years in this particular field. The government identified the fact that South Africa as a country, we have titanium and its alloys in abundance, but this is in the ore uh, form and has to be processed and uh, useful for, us, uh, for, for end users. And titanium is a material that has excellent properties, excellent corrosion properties, and can, has been ex extensively used in the aerospace industry, biomedical industry, and in the marine industry as well. The laser additive manufacturing technology is very similar to the 3D printing that you are all familiar with. The only difference being that for 3D printing machines that we are all familiar with, component parts are printed from plastics, from, AB, from ABS plastics. But in the use, for the case of the laser-based additive manufacturing, we produce component parts from metallic powders. And the laser uh, additive manufacturing, also referred to as the LMD, which is laser metal deposition, uses the laser. The laser assists to generate a pool of, uh, by melting the component surface. And the nozzle automatically deliver the powder, leaving behind uh, a, a, a deposition. I will now show you another very brief video telling you about how the laser metal deposition works. This particular video is showing how turbine blades are built. We always have a substrate and we do we, we build on the on the on the material and it's usually a near net shape. After the building we are able to easily remove the component part that is built. So as you can see the, the, with, the, with, the with the nozzle builds the material layer by layer until the full 3D component is formed. Further work on laser-based additive manufacturing was a study conducted by one of my PhD students that, I, that uh, I supervised to completion, Dr. Monamit Lotling, and this was in the field of uh, cladding titanium with hydroxyapatite co coating. The background to this study is the fact that this is the titanium alloy grade 5 with aluminum and vanadium. It's been reported in the literature that over a certain number of years, five years and above, this aluminum and vanadium deionizes into the body stream, causing some diseases, particularly the Parkinson disease. There was then a need to coat implants that are made from the titanium alloy grade five. We then use the hydroxyapatite coating. This is actually, this is our own photo taken at the National Laser Center of actual hip implant that was being built under the laser system. And these are some of the results showing good bonding and good results from that study. Another study conducted in this field was cladding titanium with copper. And this was also conducted by one of my PhD students, now a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Foley and Rio In this particular study, we, the, the study is related to marine applications in that we're trying to prevent biofouling. Biofouling, that is when we have accumulation of microorganisms on the body of the ship in the water. And this, also, this is also referred to as epibiosis. In this particular research, after cladding the titanium alloy grade five with copper, we observed that we had composites with good bonding with excellent properties. And this was conducted by using simulated sea water. 
still on this particular study of uh, titanium alloy and copper is with respect to the fact that these two materials are also relevant in biomedical implants. The risk of copper deficiency is much higher than the excess of copper content in the body. And copper has been known to, stimul to stimulate a warm flow of healing energy in the body. When copper is deficient in the body, it's been reported that it can lead to health problems such as anemia, cardiovascular diseases, impaired brain, brain function, obesity, and depression. And on this slide, I have put some, of, some copper-rich food here as a take-home <laughs> for everyone here today. <laughs> that when you see this food, on the, when you do your groceries, and you come across these food items, please pick them from time to time, because they will help you so that you will not have copper deficiency in your body system. And that is sunflower seeds, beef liver, lentils, almonds, dark chocolates. I know the children will be very happy about that. <laughs> and mushroom. Perhaps you're wondering, is this health science uh, talk? No. It is still in the field of material science and mechanical engineering. Further work on laser-based additive manufacturing are the work that, that I have conducted in the field of functionally graded materials, popularly referred to as FGM. FGM started in Japan about a decade, a decade ago, wherein researchers observed that when laminate composites are used at high operating temperatures, the material tend to delaminate at the joint interface. They needed to come up with a material that is functionally graded in order to eliminate the joint interface. In so doing, they then came up with, by varying the composition and the structure in the material over the volume, similar to what I have in this particular picture. And on this note, Myself and uh, one of my, my postdoc, we've been able to publish a book, and that is the cover page of the book here, on functionally graded materials. So please, after this lecture, look out for the book and purchase your copy tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> FGM occurs in nature, naturally. In human femur, we have materials in the body that are FGM. The human teeth, has also been reported as an FGM. It comprises of calcium and hydroxyapatite, HAP. And last year, we also had a discovery when one of my PhD students working on bamboo, we were working in the lab, and he invited me, he said, can you please join me? I'm seeing something. I'm not so sure of what I'm seeing. Then I joined him in the lab, and he said, what kind of structure is this? I said, you know what, Richard? What you have here is an FGM. He said, what does that mean? And I explained to him. And this was a discovery that the cellulose of bamboo is actually an FGM. As you can see, these are bamboo, the cellulose of bamboo. We then went ahead to write a book, and we titled it, titled it Bamboo. So again, after this lecture tomorrow, <laughs> please look out for that book on the internet published by Springer on bamboo, so that you can know more about what we have done. Typical applications of FGM are found in petrochemical and the mining industry, automobile, defense, aerospace, medicine, and in optoelectronics. And the technology is growing and really, really evolving to solve a lot of problems today. In this particular field, I have further conducted some research work on FGM by functionally grading titanium and titanium carbide. In this particular work, we're trying to improve the wear properties of titanium alloy grade 5. Titanium alloy grade 5, though has excellent corrosion resistance, resistance and behavior, it has poor wear resistance, where it involves where two components will have to rub on each other. And this particular study, what we're trying to do was to replace 
the tungsten that is used in producing landing gear of aircraft so as to reduce the weight of aircraft. And this particular work, I have been to Denel Aviation to present this work with them, and talks is ongoing with that. With that. And we have received, we've had uh, successful results from this particular work as well. <coughs> also, we've, we have conducted uh, functionally grade materials into stainless steel. Stainless steel still very relevant today. Finds applications in the use of household utensils, uh, cutleries that we use on a daily basis, cooking pots, and biomedical implants, and also in the petrochemical industry because it has very ex it has an excellent corrosion resistant uh, property. In this particular deposition, if you look at this uh, this cross section, you will observe that you observe from A to E, the materials have been functionally graded, wherein we have introduced various uh, percentage volume of, T of 316 into 17.4 pH. Now, looking at these pictures on this end here, this uh, CDE were taken at different levels of the material, yet you will observe that they all look very, very similar, whereas the compositions are very different from one another. And when we observe this type of outcome, we say it has, the material has experienced an epi e e epitaxial growth. And this has been a successful uh, work as well. This particular slide then ends my work in the field of laser-based additive manufacturing. And uh, I will now move on to talk, to talk about this particular slide. With the strategic direction of the University of Johannesburg on fourth industrial revolution, I believe that my address will be incomplete if I do not talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I don't want Prof. Mawala to stop from giving my gown this evening. <laughs> so in so doing, I then did an assessment of this, these two technologies that I've been busy working on in the last 10 years. And I compared, I, I related fourth industrial revolution to friction steel welding and to laser-based additive manufacturing. And I realized that the two technologies are compliant. So Prof. Mawala, thank you very much for that direction of the university, where we're going in the fourth industrial revolution. So on this note, I can, conv I can convincingly say that the two, te the two technologies are, full, can, they are, they are both fully automated. They are very flexible in operation. They operate at high speed, high accuracy, and easily repeatable. I also want to share something with you here. Perhaps you're looking at this screen. I say, what is this screen doing here now? Other pictures are very, very clear. But this particular one, I want to show you that Apple slims down iMac 40% with friction steel welding. If you have iMac at home or in your offices, in the frame of the, of the iMac, friction steel welding technology has been used to produce the frame of iMac. And this, the, weight, the, si the weight has been reduced by 40%. And this has been used since 2012 till date and they are still using it up until now. So the, technolo the two technologies, I can confidently say they are compliant with, the with Industry 4.0. Further to that, I also looked at the, the sustainability of the technologies. And I realized that both technologies are energy efficient. They have an efficient cooling system. They can be considered as green technologies and save cost at the long run. On life cycle impact as assessment for both technologies, they have low environmental impact index, low impact on human health, and they, have, they both have improved ecosystem quality. Look at this particular uh, gentleman here. That is Esther, raising, flagging the rent uh, equivalent there. So I said, for economic viability, don't ask me yet about the rent value of the equipment. The rent value for <coughs> friction steel welding, the last time I checked, is going for about 15 million rands. And the rent value for a complete laser system to produce, uh, produce laser-based additive manufacturing uh, uh, product is over 100 million rands. So 
I'm going somewhere with this uh, economic viability. Other research interests that I'm also into is uh, biogas generation from uh, fruits and vegetable waste. Perhaps after this lecture, if you collect enough, up to 10 kg of waste in your kitchen, please call on me and I'll come and collect them. And then I'll give you gas in exchange for your waste from your kitchen. So please take note of that as a take home from this uh, lecture. A, a, a lot of work is also being done in uh, bamboo reinforcement, which has also been very successful as well. In summary, I have provided a background and fundamentals into welding, and I have given highlights of my personal contributions in the field of fission steel welding and the field of laser-based additive manufacturing. <coughs> Both technologies can be considered as, glo as being global, highly competitive, and they have a lot of relevance in the industry. Both technologies can also be considered as being multidisciplinary in nature. Having worked in this, in, in this field in the last 10 years, I've had the opportunity to work with many other researchers in various fields of expertise. I've had to work with physicists, I've had to work with chemists, I've had to work with materials uh, sci scientists, I've had to work with civil engineers, mechanical engineers, and so many other uh, people in diverse fields. Some, some were wondering, perhaps, maybe after this inaugural now, she, at least she can rest a little bit. <laughs> perhaps. I'm not resting. I have a focus. I have a future direction. And what I'm saying is a mandala. That is power to the people. <laughs> <laughs> way too. So a mandala. So going forward, for me as a researcher, my plan is to collaborate with other researchers in this field of expertise and come up with cost-effective friction steel welding and laser-based additive manufacturing machines that will be affordable to small, medium enterprises. And I believe that this will lead to job creation and automation. And in so doing, I will continue to, to contribute in this particular field by preferring African solutions to African problems in the field of joining yet globally competitive. These are some of the references consulted particularly the pictures that I've taken from, from the internet, some of them. And on acknowledgement, I would like to thank many people who have been with me through this journey. It's been a very great one. And I would like to start by thanking my husband, Dr. Stephen Akinlabi. I call him the love of my life. And I say MD. He's been with me all the way. And in the midst of it all, I look back and all I have to say is to say thank you. The fact that he believed in me even more than I believe in myself. When I look back at the various ways in which he has really pushed me to where I am today, I want to say thank you. And to my children, Aki and Stephanie, thank you for your moral support. I know that you always tell me, mommy is too busy. And uh, I'm hoping that I have not been able to make you not to, I, I hope I've been able to convince you that you should also become professors in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank Prof. Chilizi Marwala, who has been very supportive from the beginning. When I joined UJ, then he was the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment. He pro gave me all the necessary support and he gave me all the platform to be able to grow. And as he was leaving the faculty, it was as if he handed me over to Prof. Sarab Sina. Prof. Sina then, con then continued and gave me all the necessary support to ensure that I have grown in my career. Thank you very much for, for, your, for your support. Prof. Mbawa mentioned something that uh, he said mentee became mentor. I disagree with you. <laughs> Prof. Mbawa is my mentor. When I joined the, when I joined the Accelerated uh, Mentorship Program, he agreed to mentor me from associate professor
to the full professorial level. And the very day I was, I was uh, promoted to full professor, he called me and said, now we are colleagues, so I'm no longer mentoring you, so you're, now you're on your own. <laughs> Thank you very much for your support. To various collaborators that I've had, and particularly this evening, I'm highly humbled and honored to have Prof. Majumda with me today. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Karakpo. I am highly humbled, and I really thank you for being here today. To my research team, formidable, mat, uh, formidable modern and advanced manufacturing research group, you are all here today. And uh, I look forward to attending all your inaugural lectures as well <laughs> in the very near future. Because I know I'm producing many more professors that are even going to do better than me. And to many of my collaborators in the U.S., I have uh, Prof. Uh, Kompati here of uh, MSOE in the U.S., uh, Shaku Kamara, and we have a number of uh, students and uh, colleagues around. And this is Prof. Annelies Elsbotes, who supervised my, my doctorate work at uh, Nelson Mandela <coughs> University. I want to say thank you to everyone. And to all my colleagues who have given me all the necessary support, who are also here this evening as well, if I have to start to mention your names one after the other, I believe we'll leave here tomorrow morning. <laughs> and I don't want to take your time longer than this. I also recognize my uncle, a professor from the Northwest University, who traveled all the way to be here to honor me this evening. Thank you very much. And to everyone, all my friends and families who are here this evening, I want to say a very big thank, thank you to you for coming to honor me this evening. And I know that God will honor you as well. Now to wrap up, uh, quite a number of my sponsors, the CSIR, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, UJ has been very supportive, I've received funding from the university, ESCOM, the National Research Foundation, the National Science uh, Foundation, and also the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Award as well. And on this note, I would like to say, Kealu Boha, Baya Danki, Thank you. Esteemed Professor Marwala, Professor Mova, Professor Akinlabi, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Good evening to all of you. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to be here in the professorial inaugural ceremony of Professor Akinlabi. Professor Akinlabi is known to me since the year 2014 when she visited IIT Kharagpur in collaboration with myself and Professor Sisha Pitwana under the DST NSF collaboration program. Since then, we had been interacting with each other in academic collaborations as well as we organized several conferences together and we worked in a book chapters and also we are in the process of supervising one joint student. So the collaborations as well as academic interactions ended up with new important works in different areas like laser materials processing, the bioimplant materials uh, by surface engineering process, advanced characterizations, and many other field of activities in the area of material science as well as manufacturing. In fact, uh, I am here today because we had a strong bonding between us, and this is the theme of our top topic of our lecture in this particular <laughs> inaugural function. So Professor Akinlevy has delivered an excellent talk covering a wide spectrum of joining of materials and manufacturing in manufacturing technology, starting from its utility in the human evolution to its application in machines and different components. So I was indeed wondering the way he, he, he made her journey from the very beginning of human evolution to the machineries and application of hybrid technologies, application of friction star welding, application of laser additive manufacturing, which are really future of the welding techniques. Weldings are a very, very important part of life, 
particularly if you talk of uh, manufacturing technologies. Manufacturing of products, it is very much integral part. And when you talk about welding techniques, it started with that all solid state welding processes like uh, friction welding and also the hammering and solid uh, welding processes. And then it went to the different other types of conventional welding techniques by application of different uh, oxyacetylene gas flame as well as application of arc flame. So these things were very much old in nature, though those are conventional and people are were using it quite often. But recent dated uh, work, if you think about it, you'll find that now those kind of uh, pro conventional processing is no more there, particularly if you think about the environmental regulations, people are trying to go through the modern welding techniques, which are green enough, and particularly friction start welding and laser welding, laser additive manufacturing, those are the categories under the green welding techniques. Now, the way Professor Akhilda we explained about those techniques, which are very much new and modern, but still to come up because of its expensiveness in nature, particularly the cost of those welding units, like friction start welding, and also very complex to, I mean, those processes are quite complex because you have to optimize several parameters in order to get the best result in the welded product. And the way she explained her work, it was indeed real, really it is, I must appreciate it. Particularly the way she, she upgraded the typical milling unit to welding unit, that friction start welding unit, that I did never think of. I was in fact thinking of taking this idea to my home and think of starting a friction start welding machine. That would indeed uh, reduce the cost of the unit to a large extent. Because expensiveness is a, particularly if you th think about the friction start and laser welding techniques, for both the techniques, the cost is of real importance. Because if you have to install the unit in academic institution, you have to think a lot. But the way he did, collaborated with different institutions, uh, her alma mater, and did a lot of work, that is really of great, and we must appreciate her. Professor Akin Levy is a uh, well-renowned scientist and academician who sets an example to all of us because of her ability to excel across the disciplines. For example, you saw he started her, she started her activities with uh, welding and then went to different uh, biogas generation related project as well as bamboo structure. So this is really, a, and her activity actually started with agriculture engineering as her basic degree and the way he she crossed act, the all barriers and came to mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering scientists basically, particularly in the field of mechanical and manufacturing engineering that we must appreciate all. And being a lady, particularly I understand the barriers she had to cross in each step. Her contribution as a lady is really quite important and we have to see that she has to excel in each and every step for getting her work recognized. Particularly her contribution in teaching and research is commendable. Her research contribution covers almost all disciplines of modern manufacturing techniques, starting from friction start welding to surface engineering, laser materials processing, additive manufacturing, and functional graded materials. On friction start welding, particularly, uh, particularly for the case of aluminum to copper, the way she, she established that particular friction start welding, uh, defect free welding and optimize the parameters that is really great and for that she is among the 5% of the top ranked uh, researchers in this field. And her contribution to human resource development is also excellent. She produced almost 7 to 8 PhD students, several dozens of uh, undergraduate as well as uh, postgraduate uh, projects she guided, she mentored. And those are really of though her students will be strength in future, in a, in, in a future very shortly actually. And all her PhD students are well established in their field of research. Her talent is particularly reflected from her publication records and important prestigious awards like Distinguished Women Scientist Award in 2016 and several others actually I missed. Why to National Research Fellowship rated researchers and several research grants from inter alia the Science, uh, National Research Foundation, Council of Sound Scientific and Industrial Research, Technology Innovation Agency, Tertiary Education Support Project, Grant for ESCOM, the National Science Foundation, and Royal Academy Grant of the United Kingdom.
So these are all, I mean, this reflects how important she is in our field of research and how talented she is. Now in this very auspicious day, we must give her a big hand for her steady, excellent performance, congratulate her, and wish her all the best. And not but before, the, before starting, before finishing my talk, I also congratulate her husband, Professor Dr. Esther Akinlevy, Dr. Stephen Akinlevy, and her uh, children for supporting her all along. So with these few words, I must congratulate Professor Akinlevy once again, and wish her all the best, and pray to God for her very strong, uh, passionate uh, passion for research, as well as uh, her uh, good uh, health, as well as a successful career ahead and also peace and happiness all throughout her life. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Akin Labi has professed. <laughs> I think uh, she raised very important issues that I think are at the core of our developmental agenda as a country and as a continent. And I think we should give her another round of applause. <laughs> now, by the powers vested in me, I now invite uh, Professor Akin Labi and Professor Mbowa to come for for robing her with uh, the trinket. <laughs> 